Let us prepare ourselves with the call to worship. Come, take off your shoes, for we are standing on holy ground. Shake off the dust as we're ready to start fresh. Let us worship the Lord and ready ourselves to receive Jesus' wonderful teachings so that we may be renewed and strengthened by the word of God. And together we light the Christ candle to remind us that Jesus is always with us. And sometimes it takes more than one spark to get it going. Good morning and welcome to Paula Memorial on this beautiful Sunday. We're so glad you could join us. We just have a few announcements about events going on in the life of the church. Just a reminder, we have started our in-person worship. Worship is at 10.30 on Sunday morning. We do have a very tight limit on how many people are able to come right now, but as we are in line to go into stage three, we're hoping that number will increase. If you wish to join us for in-person worship, you can find the links on both our Facebook page and our website to Everbright, and you can record that you wish to attend, or you can feel free to contact me and I will sign you up if there is space. We have exciting news that as of this coming Monday, I will be back in the church office. So if you would like to come and see me, or if you'd like to contact me, please feel free to call me at the church. The office hours will be 9 to 2, and please call me. I look forward to being to hear from all of you. Now let us come before our God. Let us pray. God of holy love, we joyfully gather our hearts before you this day as we come to hear anew the story of your salvation. We come to receive your grace and your healing peace. So we come before you now with our prayers of adoration, trusting in your promise to always listen to your children praying. God of creation and Lord of life, we praise you this morning for the world around us. During the summer months, we're often invited to rest for a period of time as we rediscover our joy in the world that you made for us out of love. We praise you, mighty God, for the beauty that surrounds us, for the songs of the birds and the peace we find during the summer months. We thank you for the wonderful gift of the earth and the mysteries that are still waiting to be found. We praise you, Holy Lord, that you love us so much that you gave us your only Son. For Jesus was willing to leave behind his glory for our sake so that we could be healed and set free from all that once held us captive. We praise you, Lord, for the many teachings of Jesus, 
for the way in which Christ's teachings still speak directly to our hearts. As this day, we're still able to learn and grow thanks to the works of your only Son. We praise you, Lord, that Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to go as far as the cross and the grave for our sake, so that by his wounds we could be healed and brought into his resurrection. Loving God, this time we now lift up to you all that lays heavy on our hearts and our minds. Merciful God, we lift up to you the places in BC that are currently being threatened by wildfires. We pray for those who have already lost their homes, those who are worried about family that they've not yet been in contact with. Father, be with your people during this fearful time. Send your Holy Spirit to inspire people to come up with new solutions to prevent the spread of fires and encourage people to be ready to reach out and support their neighbors in need. We continue to pray for those in Florida who have been affected by the collapse of the condo. Send your Holy Spirit to rest upon those who must now bury their loved ones and your peace upon those who are still digging through the wreckage. Lord, be with your people during this time of sorrow and loss. Guide their feet to where they can receive all the help they need as they continue to deal with the loss. We pray for those in our life who are ill, those who are waiting to receive treatment. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of a loved one and those who are longing for life to go back to normal. Lastly, Father, we pray for ourselves. Help us, we pray, to always be aware that you are with us and to be ready to welcome and learn from anyone you happen to send our way. All this we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Hi everyone, it's Reverend Lisa. You'll notice we're not at the church, but this is because we have a special children's story for you. Now I have a question for everyone. If you were given the choice between these two bags, which one would you pick? Would you pick this one that looks really pretty and looks like it could be for a birthday party? Or would you pick the plain white bag that could be used from anything to holding a sandwich to holding someone's pills? So take a moment to think about which one you would pick just by appearances itself. Do you have it in your head which one you're going to pick? Well, let's open this one because this one looks so exciting. I wonder what's in here. It could be a toy or some candy or absolutely nothing. There's nothing in this bag. It looked pretty on the outside, but it was pretty empty on the inside. So, well, let's look at this one. I don't know, maybe it's got an apple? It doesn't have an apple. It has something pretty amazing inside. And that's what Jesus wants us to remember, is we're not called to judge each other by what, look, what we see on the outside. In today's gospel story, we hear about how Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth, but no one believed that he could do the amazing things he was doing. They said, Jesus is just a carpenter. He works with his hands. He can't heal the sick or teach about the kingdom of heaven. And so they turned their backs and they refused to listen to Jesus. And this made Jesus really sad because he wanted to save people in his community. So we ended up going somewhere else to spread the good news. And we're called to remember this today because if we judge people by first appearance, we're often disappointed. But if we take the time to know what someone's like on the inside, to see how kind they are, how generous they are, we're often surprised and amazed at what a beautiful and wonderful person they are. So I hope you'll remember this next time you meet someone new. And judge them not by what your eyes see, but instead judge them by how God sees them as someone important, as someone he loves, and someone he sent Jesus to come save. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Our first reading is from 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 12, verses 2 to 10. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than it is warranted by what I do or say, or because these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. So that, Christ's power, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Our second reading is from Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? 
What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't he the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus sends out the twelve. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing on the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a six-year-old child growing up, it was a happy time for me. It was a happy time for our cousins, who all got together on a Sunday and came to Sunday school. We learned about Jesus, we sang songs, and we knew that when Sunday school was over, we would be back the next week to see our friends again. It was a charming time. And as I sing this song, I think about our dear loving, begotten, indigenous people who aren't that fortunate. This song is for them.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You can't be the preacher. You're too, you look too young. You can't do your ministry year at our church. You're too young. And truthfully, you'll never be a good minister because you're a girl. The last part was unspoken, but it was made clear to me the message he wanted to get across. These are only a few of the roadblocks I had to overcome during my days of seminary, as people were quick to dismiss me and my value because of the way I look or because I happen to be born with two X chromosomes rather than XY. And I know I'm not the only one who's had to overcome these challenges in ministry. It happens all the time as people are overlooked because they don't fit into the proper image of what a preacher should be. Sometimes they get overlooked because they're too old, too academic, not academic enough. There are countless reasons why people are not able to use their God-given gifts for the building up of God's church. And I'm sad to say this is not something new to our generation. Even Jesus himself struggled to do his job in his hometown because people refused to look beyond the fact of what they thought they knew about Mary's son. In today's gospel reading, we hear what happened when Jesus went to his hometown. At this point in the life of ministry, Jesus has already gathered his disciples. He's calmed a storm and raised the dead, all while preaching about the coming kingdom of heaven. Jesus has already opened the minds of countless people with his teaching and his healing. And yet, when he comes back to his hometown of Nazareth, the very same people that he grew up with, they turned their back on what he had to offer. As Jesus taught in the synagogue, his message fell upon deaf ears. As people refused to believe that someone as lowly as a tradesman would ever be able to say something important about their life. While others complained that they knew Jesus' family, his brothers and his sisters, and because of this fact, they couldn't believe the good news that Jesus had to share with them. And because of this, Jesus was limited to what he could do in the town he once called home. Now I know it sounds strange to hear that Jesus was limited, as he's the Son of God and we believe that nothing is beyond his reach. After all, he alone was able to overcome death itself. But in this case, Jesus was limited, not because he was powerless, but because those who he longed to reach were not willing to accept the grace and the good news he longed to share with them. Think about it this way. You could be the best doctor in the whole world, but if your patient decides they're going to give up on life, there is nothing you can do to change their mind, and the odds are high that you will lose them. Or you could be the best teacher in the world, but if a child refuses to listen to you or even make any attempt to learn, you're not going to make a great impact on someone who refuses to open their mind to new knowledge. Or if you refuse to come to worship because there's a guest preacher, even if they are the best preacher in the world, you're not going to get anything out of it because your mind is closed already to anything they might offer to help feed your soul. This is what happened to Jesus so long ago when he went back home. People refused to believe he could offer up anything important to their lives because they could see him only for what he once was, a tradesman, rather than who he truly was, which was a son of the living God the long-awaited Messiah. I can't even imagine how hard it must have been for Jesus to see people who he longed to help, people who he longed to heal and set free from the captivity of their sin, 
And yet, no, he could not, because they weren't willing to see him in a different light. And we today, if we're not careful, can fall into the same trap of missing out on something wonderful that God has planned for us because we're not able to see beyond the packaging that this good news is wrapped in. How do you think he would react if Jesus were to come again into our world in the form of someone in the working class? Would you be able to sit at the feet of a cashier and listen to what they had to say about the coming kingdom of heaven? Would you be willing to sit and listen to someone who flips burgers for a living talk about how their faith has changed their lives and then invite you to experience that same change? If you heard about a migrant worker who was able to heal people in the name of the Lord, would you be willing to go and seek the healing you needed? Or would you dismiss what you'd heard because someone that low on the social ladder can never be that powerful? Would you today be willing to allow Jesus to come into our church and preach, with his feet dusty from the road and his robes frayed from hard travel? In our world, we're told not to judge a book by its cover. And yet we all do it. As people sometimes cautiously and sometimes unconsciously decide who we're going to listen to or who we're going to follow based only by outside appearance. If the person fits into what we think is the right image for the job, only then are we willing to accept their leadership, accept their gifts, And if they don't live up to our expectations, we tend to dismiss them without a second thought. But when we do this, we can often find out that we missed on a life-changing experience or opportunity. Just as the people in Nazareth did so long ago, for the Son of God walked among them, freely offering them the healing and the grace that their hearts longed for, but they turned their backs on Jesus and they missed out on what they needed. We're told in the gospel that Jesus is only able to heal the willing. He's only able to teach those who are willing to stop and listen. And at the end of the gospel story, we're told that Jesus was amazed at their disbelief. Amazed at their disbelief. That's not something we ever want to be heard about our church. So the question remains, how do we prevent ourselves from becoming like the people in Nazareth? How are we called to learn not to judge a book by its cover when this is a lesson the world has taught us from a very young age? as none of us gathered here today want to miss out on the wonderful things our Heavenly Father has planned for us. But it's so hard not to fall on bad habits. But this doesn't mean we're not able to change, as even Nazareth, one of the most hostile places for Jesus' ministry, Christ was still able to heal a few people. He was still able to reach a few hearts. And what Jesus was able to do in the past, he is still able to do for us today. And here's the hard part. If we want Jesus' spirit to come and walk among us, to transform us from people of Nazareth to people of the living God, you and I need to learn how to be open how to be open to whomever God might send our way. We need to come together as one body in Christ to create a spirit-filled atmosphere where we not only believe, but we act in a way that proclaims to the world that God is with us, that God is speaking to us, 
that God is hard at work in our life and that God is hard at work in the lives of those who we meet. Imagine for a moment if during today's worship service, you believe with all your heart that this message was written just for you. How would that impact how you hear it? Or how would you react if you knew in your heart that the phone call of a friend who just called out to reach you happened because God knew that you needed to hear a friendly voice? And how would you feel if you knew that sharing your faith story would be able to have a deep impact on someone else's life? Would you be willing to share it? Even if you never went to seminary or stood in front of a pulpit, our true role in life as followers of Jesus is to act as if we know that Christ is with us always, that Christ is hard at work in the world around us. This means we have to live our lives ready to learn from whoever God might send our way to teach us about his love. I know looking back at my own life, some of the best teachers of Jesus never went to school to become preachers. Instead, they preached the gospel in the way that they treated one another, the way they chose to live with the servant's heart, the way they chose to follow Jesus no matter what. For Jesus himself chose to identify with the lowly, for he knew that he needed him the most. And even though he was judged and found lacking because of it, Christ never gave up, and our world was forever changed. And today we're called to do the same, not to allow people's judgment to limit our ministry or our mission, For we know that God is with us. We know that Jesus came for us. And we know the Holy Spirit is present in our life and in our ministry. And if we live each day with these simple truths in our life, then we know at the end of our earthly journey, Jesus himself will be amazed at our belief. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your generous offerings. So much so, we cannot help but respond in kind. We ask that you bless this humble offering. May it grow and multiply and serve your needs. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 